Happy Monday, folks. This is Dr. Emily Sherding with American Resiliency. I had on the calendar to check back in on predictions I made in the fall in this video, Signs from Noah and from Nature. I put this video out in September and I said in the video I'd reflect on it, so I wanted to do that. And I want to talk a little bit about sources of knowledge. I want to share with you one of the most beautiful syntheses of knowledge sources I've seen in all of my working years. We'll get to this in a little bit. Let's do a reality check first, follow up on my winter predictions. So basically in that Noah and nature video, Noah was giving my region equal chances for a snowy winter. So I figured why not look at folk signs for if the winter would be snowy or not. I showed away a lot of my fall bearing fruit and nut trees were bearing really heavy. That's the folk tradition I was taught through my maternal line to look at fall bearing fruits to judge the intensity of snow and cold in the coming winter. And looking back on it, that was a weird winter. In Iowa, this last winter was our warmest winter ever, but it did also have a winter intensity that set cold records across the state. It was such a notable cold event that you can see Noah made a page for it. At my place, you can see there's snow drifts all the way up to this eight foot tall fence here. And all throughout the yard, it was at least three or four feet. This is the edge of my oldest child's fort, which he'd previously built up. It was about four and a half, five feet tall. You can see it's almost buried except for the high point. This was a lot of snow. And one of my hopes with putting the baby prairie in, baby prairies over here, was that it would serve as a windbreak so that we'd get more snow accumulation in the yard. And did it ever work this year? Our hopes really came true this winter. Here, this is embarrassing. The wind and the snow were so fierce. They found a crack in one of my windows and they filled it up entirely with snow. You can see that there are beads of ice on the inside of the window. Ice on the inside of the window and ice on the inner doorknob when you grab it to go outside. They're the sort of thing you don't see every winter in Iowa, but when you do, you realize why many people don't want to live here. So I would say this was an intensity of winter cold and snow that matched what I would expect from the degree of the fall bearing fruit production. I think it's interesting to separate out winter intensity from winter duration which we do in the state level videos by looking at both cold loss and projected changes for plant hardiness zones. As a note on local observed ecosystem impact. So, you know, the folk wisdom is that the Lord puts a kindness of fruit through the trees to feed the birds and creatures because they need more energy. They need more food to survive the intense cold. What I saw was that in this winter, which was on average very warm with more active days for most local creatures, the fall bearing fruit was very important for their survival in February and early March before the new growth began. And it makes me think about that folk wisdom about intensity, about a big snow. You know, it's not about a long snow. You actually you look at the woolly bear caterpillars for that, of course. But when we talk about intensity in a system, intensity goes both ways. If you're running hot or if you're running cold, intensity increases your energy demands. So I thought that was interesting. And looking back, I do feel like putting together signs from Noah and from nature helped me prepare better for the winter personally. I wouldn't have been prepared for the degree of winter intensity without the signs from nature. That's a big part of why I got so much all new winter gear for my kids, which they totally needed. And I would have been more disturbed personally by the unusual winter warmth in our area on average without having looked at the signs from Noah. So I was glad, I was glad I consulted both ways. Though I must say, I got some pushback from the video from viewers who were upset by the inclusion of non-scientific information. And I can understand that. I do think though that science is not the only valid source of information. And I think we can cut ourselves off from meaningful knowledge sources and do harm to living things when we adhere too closely to science as a sole source of knowledge. Birds always put these issues into focus for me. I'm gonna tell stories today. I'm gonna to tell you two stories about birds. So these are back in the day stories. These are young Emily super science stories when I was doing all kinds of comic book type stuff. When I was down in Florida at our shuttle launch, back when I worked for NASA in this picture here, it was very exciting. It was very exciting to see the shuttle go off. It was a night launch. It turned night into day. It was like the 4th of July on steroids. The next day though, I saw the first roseate spoonbill I ever saw in the wild. Bird. These birds are so crazy. My lab group, we were driving to some more comic book style super science adventures and I saw this wonderful, beautiful, hideous bird flying along the highway. 
And I just laughed for joy. I felt my whole heart raise up. I was so happy to see this wonderful wild bird. And I knew in my heart, I had so much more joy from this bird than that shuttle launch. I had so much more joy too from my students than I ever had from the wet bitch that I needed to change my direction. That was a big moment for me. That was when I changed my focus for how to reach people. And that's my first story about a bird. My second story, it's about 214 birds. It's about 214 of these birds. These are great tailed grackles. When I was a graduate student back at ASU, I saw a lot of these birds. They're shiny, friendly birds. You can see in this picture, they're very proud of themselves. This is characteristic of them. They have a lot of self-determination and dignity, these birds. They've got attitude. I used to eat my lunch outside and watch these birds very engaged in their bird drama. The males, of course, in birds, particularly dramatic and beautiful, it was very easy to tell who was the king of the birds in any particular part of campus. One of my friends came to me one day. She said, hey, you love those grackles. I see you watching them all the time. Come see my lab mate's thesis presentation. So I'll go along with her. It's a presentation where her lab mate has proven that the shiniest grackles have the best reproductive fitness because they have the biggest testicles. He proved this by capturing and killing 214 birds and dissecting them to measure their testicles, which in birds, testicles are a deep internal structure. And everyone's like, wow, dude, way to prove this important thing about birds. And I sat there and I felt sick and foreign to see my colleagues and fellows congratulating themselves about proving this self-evident thing for which they had killed hundreds of beautiful wild birds. I mean, birds aren't modest. Anyone who paid the world any attention would have seen the shiniest male birds were absolutely the birds who were getting it on constantly. So why did this knowledge system mean all those pretty boys had to die, you know? It still makes me sad. And the sadness is for many things. That's my second story about birds. That was another time birds showed me I still wasn't really quite in the right place. Now I'm gonna show you something that I think is very beautiful. This is a link to a document you should check out. Right there on the page, you check out version two, right there, download it. That's a link to a PDF. You gotta click on that and find out for yourself. If you wanna see this beautiful work, this deep weaving of sources of knowledge, I'm not gonna flip around in the PDF because it asks you not to. It asks to be seen as a composite work. But you should download this, you should read the introduction, and then you should look at the depth of the hardcore science and deep wisdom traditions being fused in this document. Recently, I went to a talk that incorporated this document. You can watch it on YouTube here. You can see this is the kind of video quality I really vibe with if you've spent some time on the channel here. This is a virtual program from the 1854 Seated Territory Group. They're doing climate change adaptation planning. This is a cool video. It's a cool space to be in. If you get into that space, if you can go there, you want to learn, you want to listen, folks from many tribal and scientific entities are sharing knowledge, putting together the vulnerability assessment with the sort of projection figures I use to put together state level outlooks. The folks there, they're doing this so that they can think in detail about how the changes will affect us all. And I mean us all, all living creatures. These are good places to go to sit and listen and take in some wisdom. I consider this space I showed here, that online space there to be on the cutting edge of innovation. The Anishinaabe have pushed the front forward on climate work for a long time. For many, many decades, the Anishinaabe have pushed the front first. And now that they are putting together this vulnerability assessment, with projection data, I think that they are showing us a powerful new approach to get on the right path. I strongly encourage you to take up further learning on these sources I'm sharing today. When I go to these things, I feel like maybe it helps me see the right path because this is a path where I know other people who are looking at these things, they also see the birds and they take joy in them and they see them as our fellow living things, as our fellows that they matter, that they're not rightly secondary to us in our personal concerns, that they're part of our personal concerns. In these years of change, it's important to stay alert and take in new information. I know some of you on the channel here will be irritated by the fact that I am acknowledging a synthesis source, a source that starts with prophetic tradition, if you read the first page, as what I believe to be the most cutting edge work in the field today. 
and I welcome your critique. I know also that some of you here on the channel, you don't really trust science and you're here with a very skeptical eye, which is good because science is a tool. I myself, I was really bothered by those trust the science flags during COVID because science is a process, science is a tool. And when you make science into your religion, it's about as internally consistent as worshiping a hammer. For those of you who are willing to consider science as an important source of knowledge as you make decisions about the future, I feel like it's worth acknowledging to you, saying out loud that I am a scientist and that I don't think science should be the only tool we keep in the box. I think we need to look at the paths forward at getting on the right path. And you gotta keep your heart open in these times of change. An open mind is good too, but as they say, not so open your brain falls out. It's hard to figure out the right path. I just wanted to talk about it a little. You go download that PDF and poke around in there a little. I just wanted to share with you some work I really admire. Miigwech. Folks, thanks for watching and thanks for joining us. AR has recently passed a milestone. We've reached more than 100,000 people in America with detailed local climate information. And it's thanks to the incredible support of the AR community. There are so many folks committing their financial resources, their energy, their time to helping this information get out there. I'm so grateful to all of you, and I'm so glad that we're doing this together. Thanks for being there with me. I'm going to keep an eye on the news. I'm going to keep an eye on high consensus science. I'm going to try and get you what you need as we go through this together.